Schroders is a global independent asset manager. We manage money for our clients across all the major asset classes, so bonds, equities, cash, currencies, alternatives. We've managed money for clients in Australia for over 50 years, and our product set is you know, very well rated by the major independent asset consultants and research houses. Well, objective-based investing is actually exactly what it says. It's about constructing portfolios to achieve specific targets rather than managing money around arbitrary benchmarks that may or may not be aligned with the sorts of objectives we're trying to achieve. Uh, what do we mean by real returns? We're really just trying to grow client capital above the rate of inflation. The fund has, I guess, two broad objectives. One is to achieve a return of 5% per annum over a rolling three-year period above Australian inflation, so that we're sort of growing client capital over, over that sort of short to medium term. The other objective is to, to really do that in a way that's not putting client capital at risk. So we're very much focused on avoiding drawdowns, minimising drawdowns and keeping volatility to acceptable levels. Well, there's several key ideas that sort of sit behind the, the strategy. The first is that volatility, which is what you know, we focus on a lot in the industry, volatility is not risk. Uh, losing money, not delivering on client objectives, you know, is what we mean by risk. The, the second, I guess, key idea is that the path returns take matters. So we could be very careful about sort of avoiding big swings in capital value uh, as, as we sort of manage assets for our clients. The third, probably the most important idea, is that valuations matter. Uh, the price we pay for an asset relative to the underlying cash flows that that asset generates tells us a lot about risk and tells us a lot about return. And we need to incorporate that information into the way we construct the portfolio, the way we alter the asset mix to generate the outcomes we're trying to achieve. The portfolio invests mainly in traditional assets, so uh, everything from cash, uh, government bonds, corporate bonds, equities, currencies, across uh, bro the, bro you know, the global investment universe. What's important, though, is how much of those assets and we own um, and when we own them. So asset allocation um, is very important to us. Significantly, the strategy does not have a benchmark um, and has very wide ranges in which those exposures can operate. So if we... Uh, are really concerned about the outlook for equity markets and the potential for equities um, to fall, we could really have very little exposure um, to the equity market, zero in fact. Flip side of that is, you know, if we're very concerned about markets, we could have uh, most of the portfolio in cash. So the ability to, to manage uh, asset allocation within those broad ranges is a very important source of uh, return generation, but also a very important risk control. Well, there's a number of factors we consider, but the one we probably put at the top of the list is, is valuation. You know, the idea that you know, the price we pay has a big impact on the returns that are generated and the risk associated with that, that asset. So a lot, a lot of our emphasis is on trying to understand value within assets and what that means for returns. We also need to think about where we are in the cycle because asset markets can stay over or undervalued for extended periods of time. So a lot of our analysis uh, is sort of spent thinking about uh, the likely behaviour of markets against you know, the various sort of stages of, of the cycle. And finally, we need to consider things such as uh, liquidity conditions, factors such as the impact of central bank uh, policy, like quantitative easing, on the likely interaction between value um, and cycle and, and you know, how that sort of translates through into returns. Well, we all know markets are volatile and we expect that over time we'll get paid for that volatility. But you know, how that volatility sort of plays out is very much dependent on your own circumstances as an investor. And I'll give you an example. You know, if I'm about to retire and you know, I've got a large sum of money and markets fall significantly and I need to start drawing down on that, I don't have, I don't have a, you know, a lot of opportunity to recover um, from that big fall in market. So it significantly impacts um, my capital and how long my capital will last. But if I'm 25 and I have a relatively small balance and I get that same experience, that same fall in markets, 
it matters a lot less to me because I've got a lot more time uh, to recover and the impact on my portfolio is a lot smaller. So I've got two investors experiencing, you know, probably over their lifetime, the same average rate of return, but it impacts one investor much more significantly than it does the other. And I think that, that's why sequencing risk uh, matters a lot because you know, investors uh, have different requirements, they have different balances, uh, and the order in which returns are delivered to them um, will be very important in their ability to achieve their objectives. The aspect of risk that we think is most important is basically downside risk. You know, we, volatility is really about noise, volatility creates opportunity, but when markets fall, you know, we need to be very careful about sort of th that those falls don't endure. Um, and those falls are minimised. And in the way we manage the portfolio, we're really trying to minimise both the, the, the size and the length of those sort of drawdowns. And that's, that's very important in terms of how we, how we sort of allocate capital. Um, volatility is something we monitor, but it's a secondary consideration. But you know, on balance, we do expect portfolio volatility to be you know, probably a third of that that you would expect from an equity portfolio. Currency is an active decision. You know, we take currency positions because we think they'll either add value or we think they'll either help us um, manage risk. And, you know, to give you an example, you know, when the Australian dollar was uh, sitting at parity to the US dollar, we felt that it had a long way to fall. Uh, that was an opportunity to hold foreign currency in the portfolio and benefit from that decline uh, in the value of the Australian dollar against the US dollar. That's a return-seeking way of thinking about the currency. Another way is to recognise that there's risks that uh, investors face. For Australian investors, some of those risks are related to volatility in places like China and commodities, and holding foreign currency exposure um, can actually help offset those risks. So it can be both a source of return and a way of helping us manage portfolio risk. Industry jargon would probably suggest that you know, because it's not a pure bond or an equity investment, it fits into the alternative category. But we'd argue it's anything but. You know, a lot of our investors really see it as a whole of portfolio solution, particularly when their balances aren't large enough to give them the breadth of exposure across the sort of broader opportunity set. Alternatives typically um, are characterised by uh, leverage, uh, by a lack of sort of mark-to-market uh, pricing, um, and you know, typically have uh, bring additional risks to, uh, to to a portfolio. The the grow strategy, uh, our real return strategy, is really based built around traditional assets. Um, so in that sense, you know, we'd certainly argue it's not uh, an alternative in the sense of the way uh, the industry typically thinks of alternative investments. Well, by actively managed, there's really two parts of of the strategy that are actively managed. The first is asset allocation, so that's what assets we own and when do we own them, and that will change through time depending on uh, the outlook. Uh, the second part of the strategy that's actively managed is security selection. So within each of the asset classes we own, we'll be actively selecting securities based on our view of those securities uh, through time. Look, a key feature of uh, a listed uh, strategy such as this is that it always trades at market. So investors coming into the strategy are basically by are getting exposure to those assets at current market pricing. The buy-sell spread is really the cost of new investors coming in and accessing those assets and, and or investors exiting the strategy um, and selling those, those assets into the market.